Mr. Travis Glazier is the direction, Director of Intergovernmental Relations for Onondaga County. Thank you for being here. And Mr. Thomas Squires is the Administrator of Cuyahoga County. Thank you very much for being here. As is uh, complying with the rules of the committee, I would ask you all to stand and uh, be sworn in before your testimony. Please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please let the record reflect that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much. Please be seated. At this time, we will uh, open up our hearing to uh, all of you to give your opening remarks, and I will start with Mr. McMurray. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Vice Chairman Burkle and uh, Representative Kelly, appreciate this opportunity. I'm Warren McMurray. I'm the chairman of the CNS Companies. We're a 500-person architectural, engineering, and construction company. We have 14 offices uh, around the United States. And uh, the activities of the federal government as it relates to uh, uh, both legislation uh, and regulation have a significant impact uh, on our business and our ability to uh, create jobs here and elsewhere. I'd like to give you about uh, six examples of uh, things that uh, do have a direct impact on our ability to grow business. And the first relates to uh, government competition with the private sector. Uh, various presidential memoranda and federal agency guidance documents uh, over the last year or so uh, have indicated a preference on the part of the federal government to begin to remove uh, commercially available services that have historically been performed by private industry, creating jobs in the private sector, uh, into the government sector. Uh, this is harmful uh, to the private sector, especially to firms such as uh, the CNS companies, and it places a heavy and needless burden on the taxpayers who are looking for ways to, in fact, reduce the size and the expense of government, uh, much more so than to uh, expand and increase it. Uh, it's a threat to our economy in a couple of other ways, uh, specifically as it relates to uh, uh, professional services, the specialized and innovative uh, design capabilities that are available in the private sector are important to meeting government's needs. Life cycle costs uh, can be higher uh, when work is performed entirely in-house by the government. A recent study performed in the state of New York comparing uh, the services uh, of uh, private uh, design professionals to uh, government professionals uh, showed a 15% savings in uh, uh, using uh, private professionals for that purpose. And uh, it certainly can be argued strongly that uh, designing and constructing the infrastructure that we need to support our economy uh, in uh, this country and maintain the standard of living that we have uh, is certainly not inherently governmental, uh, such as uh, uh, other functions of the federal government are. Another example is the way uh, overhead is calculated. The federal government uh, promulgates uh, uh, federal regulations under the Federal Acquisition Regulation, specifically the FAR, uh, and that's used by uh, individuals that provide <coughs> services to the government uh, for calculating fees that could potentially cost, that could be potentially charged to government. Unfortunately, uh, these regulations, although they are national in nature and scope, they're interpreted uh, differently by uh, different states. And what this creates is a situation where firms like CNS that operate in multiple states across the country are uh, uh, required to uh, go through mul multiple audits in order to satisfy uh, each individual state government that uh, we're complying with the, the federal acquisition regulations, as opposed to having one cognizant audit, that uh, one calculation and one auditable amount for our company that would be accepted across the country for uh, work that is either performed directly to, for the federal government or uh, for states and local government uh, with federal funds. Uh, this creates uh, extra work for the government, it creates extra work for business, and it consumes dollars that we could be putting towards hiring people and putting them to work and being more productive. A uh, third example is uh, the 3% withholding mandate that was uh, put into place under Republic Law 109-222. This uh, creates a uh, a new requirement, a requirement that will be effective uh, in January 2012, where 3% of the gross amount of billings to any government that uh, contracts out $100 million or more for goods and services on an annual basis will be withheld as effectively a withholding tax or withholding against uh, an income tax uh, obligation. Well, first of all, in our business, uh, 
three percent is uh, frequently uh, our total profit, if that, not to uh, mention uh, the amount that we owe in taxes. It creates a tremendous uh, unfair burden on business. First of all, we will lose the use of those funds and provide the federal government with an interest-free loan for between a year and two years while we go through the reimbursement process. Uh, and secondly, it will create tremendous uh, infrastructure cost, and I mean government infrastructure cost, uh, to uh, maintain and to administer this system. Uh, this bill was uh, scored, I am told, at about an $11 billion savings in one year. Uh, the Department of Defense has indicated in, that in the first five years of implementing this legislation, it will call, cost that department alone $17 billion in order to implement it. I find it very difficult to see the logic in a one-year savings of $11 billion being justified by then spending $17 billion in just one department. And that doesn't include the costs that will be required in the state of Pennsylvania or in the state of New York in order to collect all of this money and forward it on to the federal government. Who's going to pay to hire those staff? Who's going to uh, pay for the computer programs that will be necessary to track this? Who's going to develop the paperwork and the administrative uh, infrastructure that's necessary to save $11 billion in one year so that we can all spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the future years, uh, it, just, uh, it just baffles. Uh, another area that uh, we could use some relief is in uh, uh, the Securities and, and Exchange Commission area. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act uh, created a need or, or established a requirement for municipal advisors to register. Engineers were carved out of this requirement, consulting engineers that work for government. Uh, now the SEC is writing regulations that will reapply this regulation to consulting engineering businesses that provide services to counties and cities and towns throughout our country. Uh, effectively, it's part of any consulting engineer's job to cost out alternatives, to do cash flow analysis, to provide financial analysis of uh, those things that they design and oversee the construction of, and construction contractors do the same. Improving the environment is another area. There have been numerous commissions, the, the latest of which was uh, authorized under Safety Lou, the previous surface transportation uh, legislation, uh, that have come back and recommended streamlining of environmental permil uh, permitting processes. So we were talking, or you were talking earlier about the EPA. The EPA has a very valid uh, mission and needs to uh, make sure that we're paying attention to our natural resources nationwide. But the reality is that when we have to do a draft environmental impact statement, a final environmental impact statement, when we have to have state regulatory review, city regulatory, town regulatory review, national review, we are superimposing review on review on review to the point where we're so buried in review that it takes seven to ten years to build a bridge over a creek out in the country that should take us 18 months to two years uh, to design and construct and simultaneously go through the permitting process. We are burying ourselves in administrative costs and in uh, delays that drive the costs up as well. Uh, the last item I wanted to mention is immigration reform. You've already heard other speakers, so I will be brief. Uh, we have 65,000 H-1Bs uh, authorized nationally. CNS employs hundreds of engineers and scientists. Uh, we need access to uh, those uh, that graduate uh, from uh, colleges with uh, engineering and scientific degrees in this country uh, that are not necessarily U.S. residents and citizens. Uh, we need the, the availability of those people so that we can create additional jobs, more economic activity, and uh, compete in, in a global marketplace, uh, which is definitely what we have uh, in, our, in the world we have today. So thanks for uh, conducting these hearings, and uh, thank you for uh, listening to my comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Mr. Glazier? Madam Chair, Representative Kelly, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry, by the way, I'm speaking on behalf of Deputy County Executive Matt Millay, who was able to be here today. He's the Deputy County Executive in charge of physical services for Onondaga County. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, the committee today. I thought this would be a good opportunity to discuss the impact of federal mandates on our municipality, specifically how federal mandates that provide one-size-fits-all approach have created waste and inefficiency in the use of tax dollars and drive up property taxes. Onondaga County has strived to provide its residents with a clean, healthy, and safe place to live. 
As with many historic urban areas, our community, our, our, excuse me, our county and city have had to deal with the challenges of environmental cleanup, aging infrastructure, and decreasing population base to support these needs. Despite these challenges, we have made monumental strides towards cleaning up our lakes and modernizing our infrastructure for wastewater treatment. However, despite all these efforts, Onondaga County continues to fight an uphill battle. This is due in part because federal mandates that fail to take into account an analysis of costs and benefits tied to mandatory regulatory actions, and that can, and that can result in scarce tax, do tax dollars being spent on compliance measures that are neither effective nor equitable. One example concerns the federal government's apparent efforts to pursue uniform national nutrient control standards for surface waters across the country. Reliance on approaches that do not count for varying ecological conditions on nutrient pollution in different water, in different water bodies and the use of one-size-fits-all technology approaches to address nutrient pollution problems can result in major public expenditures with little or no improvement in water quality. Site-specific factors, the costs of controls, and current economic conditions all call for approaches other than mechanical application of outdated command and control methods. Onondaga County and the City of Syracuse, like many communities across the country, support aging infrastructure systems. The combined sewer system that leads to sewer overflows here in Syracuse has been in place for over a century, and as a result, would be excessively costly to completely replace to address to address the challenge, <clears throat> Onondaga County has taken a lead role in implementing innovative and balanced approach to combine sewer overflows that combines elements of traditional gray infrastructure as well as more practical and cost-effective green technology or green infrastructure. That captures rainwater where it falls rather than constructing large treatment plants that cost a lot to build and operate. The challenge we face is applying innovative and cost-effective approach approach to combine sewer overflow is that regulatory community is geared towards decades old traditional technology approaches that can be somewhat inflexible and resistant to integrating these new innovative approaches and practical compliance schedules, design approvals, and compliance monitoring methods. Regulatory guidance documents and compliance criteria have been written have not been written for the new green technologies. This inhibits the pursuit of more cost effective approaches to these widespread challenges. Another example is the EPA needs to establish a national sanitary sewer overflow wet weather policy that incorporates cost-effective, realistic wet weather-related standards. SSOs, uh, sanitary sewer overflows, are overflows of sanitary sewers resulting from a number of factors including significant wet weather events such as heavy rains and rapid melting snow pack, or the combination of the two. Currently there are no EPA approved national wet weather standards. And this has left uh, wastewater collection systems such as the county's vulnerable to enforcement actions following record-setting weather events that exceed the approved design standards even after the district has expanded million, expended millions of dollars to construct the projects whose design has been approved by the permitting authorities. In Onondaga County, wastewater treatment is supported by usage fees. The costs and penalties for non-compliance and infrastructure improvements drive up these user fees. These user fees, combined with the excessive property tax burden in our region, have created an unfriendly business environment. From the perspective of a local municipality, there's no local control over these mandates. While Onondaga County has been, a, has, has been in a monumental effort to mitigate these issues around CSOs and ensuring clean water, the residents are still penalized for situations that are the result of circumstances out of their control. In closing, there are significant benefits to federal regulation. However, instituting more practical assessment of the cost effectiveness to regulatory measures would relieve some of the unnecessary burdens that have resulted in the outcomes which are far beyond the scope of fiscal possibility. The proper recognition of fiscal limitations <laughs> that exist in the goals set forth in these mandates, coupled with greater flexibility in the implementation of solutions by local stakeholders, will promote promote a more business friendly environment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Glazier. Mr. Squires. Madam Chair, Representative Kelly, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. And I'd like to especially thank you for conducting this hearing in Central New York here locally. That's a, a great honor certainly for all of our community here in Central New York. So thank you for that. 
I'd like to take a few minutes and give you some examples of how federal action, regulation, and inaction hinder Cuga County in hiring employees, cost us revenue, and increase our costs. We receive millions of dollars in federal aid, primarily in the, primarily in the area of health and human services. All of these grants come with specific accountability and reporting requirements, requirements that cause staff to take time away from the core program to fulfill. The Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF program, is a good poster child of this phenomenon. Due to federal regulation, the district staff spends a huge amount of their time on meeting the federal requirements for employ employability reporting. To be eligible for federal TANF dollars, we must count, track, and report for every TANF adult the time spent in countable work activity. We have coding requirements and monthly work verification reporting. This is labor intensive and could result in state and local penalties if not done. These requirements take away from work we could be doing with the clients. It eats up valuable staff time, takes resources away from the community for, for no more than reporting to the government. The federal government also has strict requirements in place to entitle counties to be eligible for Title IV E reimbursement for child welfare costs. There is a complex set of eligibility criteria that must be met. If all criteria and documents are not found, there is loss of funding based on federal audits. Costs associated with child welf welfare are huge expenses for the county. Due to the complexity of the requirements, we had to dedicate staff to function as our eligibility team. Again, a lessening of the requirements will enable counties to dedicate much needed resources to the clients. To be sure, requirements are needed to protect the taxpayers. We respectfully ask that your committee look at decreasing the requirements for all federal programs so that our staff may spend more time delivering the program services that the taxpayers pay for. Many times the federal government pushes mandates down to the states and in turn down to the counties. Many times these mandates aren't as applicable and, and should not apply to the counties because we're much smaller entities than the states. Along these lines is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. While noble in title, this act is filtered down to local jails, requires additional documentation, investigation, and reporting that frankly is not necessary at the county level. It may be appropriate for larger facilities, but in our case will probably require adding an additional staff position to fulfill the requirements we don't believe should apply to us anyway. In some counties, Indian nations have been allowed to sell tobacco products and gasoline exempt from sales tax. In our county, the cost is measured in the millions of dollars, as well as lost jobs and commerce to businesses that comply with the sales tax law. The Cayuga Indian Nation has applied to the Bureau of Indian Affairs for land in Seneca and Cayuga counties to be taken into federal trust. These counties in the state of New York have repeatedly and vehemently opposed these trust applications because their approval would impose a sovereign Indian reservation on the counties, which would mean not only land coming off the school, town, and county tax rolls, but the uncontestable opening of Class II electronic bingo parlors, thus bringing gambling to counties that do not want it. It would also totally remove local jurisdiction over the lands placed in trust. House Bill H.R. 1231 would allow any federally recognized Indian tribe to be granted land and trust. The Cuga Indian Nation was not federally recognized in 1934 and would not be eligible to have land placed into trust except for a provision in the bill called the carcerary fix. We strongly urge all members of the House to oppose this carcerary fix provision in the bill. I'd like to mention briefly unemployment. Somewhat regularly, Cuga County decides to not hire when the position may be temporary or seasonal in nature. There is a local cost to unemployment. The decision to not hire is always driven by our desire to avoid the cost of unemployment. In some cases, these, in some of these cases, the position may have the potential to turn into a permanent position. Unfortunately, too many times you aren't able to go down that road and explore that option. I would urge the committee to change the eligibility requirements for unemployment or decrease the local share to allow us to put more people to work. In closing, I would like to thank again the committee for giving me the opportunity to be here today. On behalf of Cuba County, I thank you for all the support from the federal government and ask that you continue your hard work in finding ways to reduce the federal impediments to the official, efficient operation of local government. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you all very much, and thank you for your testimony this afternoon. Um, it's interesting because this morning we had a hearing over in uh, Monroe County and in Arundelpoit. And we heard from Monroe County, the county executive, um, and we also heard from the sheriff of Wayne County, who many of their issues were very similar to yours. 
but the interesting part, and we even heard it from the panel that preceded you, these rules and these regulations are made without the players being at the table. And these unfunded mandates create such a burden on the counties and the local governments to, and, and the taxpayers uh, without them having any say in how those programs are going to be executed. Uh, we got onto the topic of Medicaid in Monroe County this morning, which is a, a separate hearing. Um, my first question is to Mr. McMurray. I'd like to have you explain to us um, this SEC registration of municipal advisors. So are you saying that pursuant to Dodd-Frank that engineering firms are now going to be treated as if they were financial advisors? No, the, uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, indicated in uh, Section 975 that they were exempting uh, engineering uh, engineers providing engineering advice and uh, that was because Congress recognized in the preparation of the legislation that what was targeted here were financial advisors people that are advising on bank financing people that are advising municipalities on bonding on how they should what, what types of financial structured deals should be used uh, for uh, uh, public infrastructure and uh, that, of course, is not the practice of engineer and, and construction companies. That's the practice of banks. That's the practice of uh, financial folks. And so Congress specifically carved out the, uh, the engineering and construction industry. What's happening is that in the, uh, in the rulemaking that's uh, uh, going on now that the SEC is putting in place is they're kind of expanding the definition or redefining much of uh, what uh, consulting engineers do for municipalities all over the country they're redefining that now in terms that would require that we all, uh, we in the consulting engineering business, uh, obtain uh, these uh, uh, municipal advisor uh, stat certifications. And uh, so it's, it's just another example of, I think it's an example of two things. One of the, the Congress being wise and carving it out, but it's also an example of how even when Congress is wise and, and makes sure that something is appropriate, that uh, when it comes to rulemaking, uh, it, uh, it can get bifurcated. And I think that illustrates um, the issue that we've had with the health care bill as well as with Dodd-Frank, is the legislation was then handed over to the regulators, and the regulators come up with their interpretation of the law, which... And may just... not always be consistent. You know, it's, it's like uh, another example is the 1099 situation, uh, which uh, I'd like to thank both of you for your vote in support of repeal of uh, that requirement. And uh, in fact, uh, while we're on that, uh, I would hope that you would sign on to H.R. 674. That's the repeal legislation for the 3% issue that I mentioned earlier, too. Uh, but uh, uh, there, yes, there are, there are situations uh, that need to be addressed uh, after legislation has been passed. Sometimes there are things that come to light, and uh, we need to deal with afterwards. Thank you. I yield five minutes to Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Uh, just tell me about this 3%. In uh, well, you don't get paid interest on it. The government holds it. You don't get paid interest. How long do they hold it? Well, effectively, it's uh, uh, it's analogous to uh, uh, having uh, withholding out of uh, my paycheck uh, for my income tax uh, in the following year. Uh, so, effectively, it's uh, it's the same sort of thing. What uh, what's being proposed here, though, is uh, uh, is unfair on a number of levels. First of all, if uh, if we provide uh, services to the federal government and it costs about a hundred thousand dollars, the federal government says that well, about twenty to thirty percent of that has to be subcontracted to minority disadvantaged business uh, or to uh, service connected disabled business. There are a number of programs. So uh, right off the bat, we might take, uh, say, twenty dollars or, or $30,000 off of that amount that, that a company like CNS is actually going to self-perform. Then uh, there are some services that can't be performed by our company, so we turn around and possibly subcontract another five dollars or $10,000 of work. So the actual work that we would do might be in the neighborhood of $60,000 or $70,000, in my example, out of a $100,000 contract. Now, if we are lucky and uh, we make the average profit on this type of work nationally, that's going to be someplace in the 5 to 10% range. So if we take, say, $60,000 and suppose we made 5% on that, that's $3,000. That's $3,000 in profit. Our income tax obligation for that $3,000 might be 20%, 30%, depending on what corporate rate we're paying. So it could conceivably be $1,000 in my example. 
Well, with the federal government, uh, this this law will require us to have three thousand dollars deducted right off the top, and the federal government will then hold those three thousand dollars until we file our income tax and get that refund, which will be at least a year. And depending on when the services are provided, if they were provided at the end of a tax year, you follow me, or at the beginning of a tax year, it could almost be two years before you get the money back. And of course, under the under the federal acquisition regulations, to make it, it things even worse, if we do go out and borrow that money so that we can meet payroll and pay our light bill, the federal acquisition regulations FAR does not allow us to calculate interest as an eligible overhead expense. So there is no way that we can recover the interest on that money. So effectively, that comes out of our pocket. So in order to meet payroll and pay our employees and potentially add additional jobs. Uh, it's just another rock being thrown under the wheel. So the, your cost of operation that is affected by this, so is that something when you do a government contract, you have to actually bid it higher than you would normally bid it to a normal entity uh, to cover that 3% because effectively your cost of operation, or your, you know, the, the gross versus the net, I understand completely. Uh, well, we, we, you we have to somehow recoup that. We have to or try. Or you just walk away from the business. We have to try or we have to make a decision that we can't work on that particular work for the federal government. And that's going to hurt the government and hurt our taxpayers because there will be less competition. Uh, and uh, that's not an attractive alternative either. Mr. Glazer, I just want to ask you real quick because I come from a community that's, uh, that's aging also. And when we talk about this problem we have with stormwater and we have wastewater and everything else, let me ask, is there any type of remedial program? Because what I see is that the property transfer from people who own those houses, usually they're seniors, in order for them to, it, there's some point in their life where they're going to sell where they've lived and they're going to move into another 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 uh, lifestyle. That has to be fixed usually before they can sell the house, does it not? If, there, if there's a, a problem where the downspouts are tied in? Yeah, the, the downspout. In fact, Onondaga County, <coughs> excuse me, we've uh, just begun a, a, a proactive uh, downspout uh, program. Um, and I'm, I'm coming up short with the, the name of the program, but the, uh, the program is going to go deal with specifically that as houses. We've added uh, a local law that um, when houses are sold, there's a, an inspection to ensure for specifically that purpose. In, in my community, it's, it averages somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars to fix this. These are homes that are being sold for thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars worth. So a senior, really, somebody who's worked all their life, paid their taxes, lived within their means been good stewards of the community, are put in a position they really can't get out of the homes they live in because of some of this regulation. What bothers me is I know we have these these ideas that I think are going to be really great, but the unintended consequences really put people in a position where they can't, at this point in their life, actually move from where they've been because of some of this over regulation. I, and I know it's important, I know, but I, I just always been, in, it makes me scratch my head to think, why are we doing this to the people that are the most vulnerable and can't make the adjustment? Well, I think it, you know, from a, from our perspective, one of the one of the main criticisms we have is that it's a there's uh, everything's end of spout um, regulation and measurement as opposed to helping to try and find ways as, as we're proactively attempting to do, which is try and mitigate the issue where it begins. And because of the stringency of the current federal regulations, there isn't. Uh, Real recognition of, of that effort. You know, they they just sit at the end of the spout and measure, it. and because of that, we're you know we're making leaps and bounds as far as the, the situation we're in and the, the the dates and the age of our uh, fiscal infrastructure that deals with this. Um, but we're still measured by an antiquated system. It is frustrating, and it is fine, Mr. Squires. Uh, because I see this only in government, does the cost of running a program have, it's, it's totally irrelevant as to what the final, the cost-benefit analysis is. Have you seen any of these programs that make sense to you from a cost-benefit analysis? Because in private business, if, it, if, you, if the end product doesn't justify what you're doing, you either don't do it or you just go out of business. So I'm trying to understand that the cost overruns of these and it's always absorbed by the taxpayer. It, 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 any, and do you have any input in any of those programs? We don't. We don't have a lot of input as far as the, the regulation, the requirements, and the accountability and the reporting and all of that stuff. And, and I think you're you're right with the point you're driving at is that the cost of the program becomes so enormously expensive compared to the actual benefit that flows to the intended beneficiaries of the program. Um, it, it's it, it's frustrating for us when 
we, we have a whole pile of regulation, reporting and tracking and so forth, and information that needs to be given. And it costs us employees, it costs dedicated staff to do that. Um, Chair Burkle referenced earlier that government should not be the driver of jobs. And, and I absolutely agree with that. That being said, there are going to be jobs that are, are paid for and, and come from the government. It, it, it's frustrating when we have to increase the number of jobs that the government pays for, that we tax people for, for things that um, we wonder if it's just jobs that put together a bunch of data that sit on someone else's desk and they can check off on their checklist, okay, we got it, things must be fine. That's not the reality of the situation. What we wonder sometimes is if we got less money from from the federal government, the state government, passed through the state government, if we got a little bit less for the program and we were relieved of a lot of the reporting requirements and a lot of the tracking and a lot of the administrative requirements, I think we would be further ahead because we could have fewer people on our payroll that we're taxing the taxpayers for and we would end up giving more benefit to the intended beneficiaries. Thank you. Just to, uh, to give an illustration of, of your of cost benefit analysis, we spoke recently to a uh, school superintendent and he received a federal grant of $40,000 and he said that in order to comply with all of the strings attached to the $40,000, it was going to cost him close to $200,000 to administer that regulation, so it, or that grant. So it, the cost benefit analysis is uh, certainly something that needs to be done more. Just I have one last question because it came up this morning in Iran, Mr. Squares. The Prison Rape El Elimination Act. Um, I asked uh, Sheriff Verts over in uh, Wayne County if it was his understanding that there was any way for the county jails, the smaller entities, to opt out of this law. He did not think so. I don't think so. I spoke to our sheriff, Sheriff Dave Gould in Cuyahoga County, and uh, this is something that he's looking at. Our interpretation is it absolutely applies to us. We're a small facility. We're not a state facility. You know, incidents. Um, incidents is happen in jails, you know, violence and, and so forth. We think the, the staff that we have and the, the procedures and processes in place to address those issues are, are sufficient for our facility. They're appropriate. We're a well-run facility. So this is another, um, another layer of bureaucracy and administration that we have to pay for, and we estimate it's going to be a position that will be dedicated almost full-time to these kinds of regulations. Again, taxing people for positions that, in our view, aren't productive and give no benefit to the taxpayers that we're taxing. Have you been able to fix any cost to this, this law when, when it goes into effect? We, we, we think it's more work that can be absorbed by current staff, and, and we're talking about adding a staff position to do that. So the, the total cost, including fringes, would be probably somewhere in the ballpark. I'm going to guess fifty, sixty thousand dollars There may be other work that that staff person can take on, but that's the additional cost that comes as, from this, this act. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon and sharing your testimony with us. Um, your, your input is so important to us as were the, the three, the two previous panels and the three earlier today. It's so important that Congress hears from you all. And I want you to know that we will take your testimony, take the information that you've given to us, and bring it back to the full Oversight and Government Reform Committee and let them know we'll share with them the concerns and the, the regulations and the, the uh, impediments that, uh, that the federal government puts up. So thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you to those uh, who sat through this hearing and participated today. I think it's... Um, it's good for us to hear from the community, from the job creators. Uh, at this time, we will um, adjourn the meeting. The committee uh, is adjourned. Thank you all very much.